I wanted to, we were talking at the beginning about how not only are you 66, but you've been playing for 50 years now, is that right? Yeah, I, I started my first band in 1966. I mean, we were banned out of Holyoke, Mass. and. Uh, uh, yeah, we did some original stuff, but we did like, you know, Beatles, Stones, Bob Dylan, Young Rascals, and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, we were really loud. Remember that? And all our equipment came from Sears, you know, who didn't really make any of their, their musical stuff, it was made by other people. But uh, our drums yeah. came from Sears, all the amps. And uh, so when we went to a gig one night, we just turned everything on 10. <laughs> and uh, people kind of held their ears and couldn't quite figure out, people couldn't quite figure out if we were good or not, but they, right. one thing they, they all said was, they're really loud. <laughs> and so when we heard that, we thought of that as a positive thing, yeah. and we just kind of went with that from then on, because we figured, well, we kind of figured we weren't that good, but the loud thing seemed to work for us, or we thought it did anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And then I had a song copy written in 1967, which I still have in my scrapbook, it's turning yellow. And the name of the song, appropriately enough, was Nothing Seems to Happen. <laughs> yeah, which is exactly what happened. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious what the valley was like back then. Were you, did you have an opportunity to get on the road up and down the valley or further back? Well, when I was in my late teens, I was working at a bakery in, in Holyoke for buck twenty-five an hour. And a guy came to the door one night and said that this band was auditioning bass players and I had a bass. And I, Fender Jazz Bass, which I still have, and I went and auditioned, and uh, I never thinking I would get the gig, you know, I just right. went because this guy talked me into it, really, and the, the leader of the band said, what do you do? I said, I work in a bakery. He said, uh, how much do you get paid? I said, a buck twenty-five an hour. He said, go in tomorrow and tell him you quit. I said, why would I do that? He said, because we start playing in New York seven nights a week next week, and you got the gig, and you're going to make this many hundreds of dollars. And I was living with my parents, so... Back then, I had a top drawer and a bureau and just stuffed money in it and would lend my friends a hundred bucks here, there, knowing I would never see it again. But uh, So yeah, I mean, there was a whole Valley scene <clears throat> back then. That band that I was in, we went on the road and we did USO shows, went to Greenland, Labrador, traveled around. Um, did you say what the name of that band was? The Buck Rogers Movement. They put out three singles. I was, I joined, I was good at joining bands after they put out their records. Yeah, so. <laughs> I had to play the tunes, but I didn't play on the records. And they were older guys. I was a teenager, and they were all like 30 years old. So they kind of kept their eye on me. I was the kid, you know. They, yeah. But um, back then, you know, growing up, I mean, I can't say enough about like the Rock and Ramrods from Newton. I saw them open for the Kingsmen in 1966. They were a big influence on me. <laughs> Around 67, watching the Wild Weeds play at the War Memorial in Holyoke. <laughs> Young Al Anderson belting out No Good to Cry. Just blew my mind. Me and the guys in my first band, our jaws dropped to the floor. We went, that's it, we gotta quit. I was just watching this young kid from Connecticut sing the most soulful vocals ever, you know? And then you had, uh, you know, the original version of Fat, who uh, did a show uh, in another band that they were on the bill in Forest Park and they just knocked me out. I couldn't believe how great they were and, and Bold were around eventually, Clean Living and different bands that played around in the area. and. Uh, it goes on and on, really. <laughs> it, it, it's always been there. There's been like a, so much great music in this in this whole valley and in the area, and all different types of music, just a wide variety of stuff. What about uh, non-musical influences? Whether it's with story writing, storytelling. There's clearly a lot of storytelling in your songs, uh, or even just on a personal level. Yeah, I think that still comes back from the same thing of listening to records growing up listening to all those great 45s that came out in the late 50s and early 60s, pre-Beatles even, like, a, you know, a, a boy, you know, Sure the Boy I Love by the Crystals and those Everly singles, like Till I Kissed You and Instrumentally Because We're Young by Dwayne Eddy, uh, Sam Cooke's original version of Wonderful World, and uh, uh, lately I've been on a Royal Let's Kick, It's Gonna Take a Miracle, the original version of It's Gonna Take a Miracle. Laura Nero did it later with LaBelle, but the original by the Royal Let's, you can look it up, Google it when you get home. It'll knock you out, it just blows me away when I wanna hear a great song, I just listen to that and I go, okay, I got nothing going on. This is like, you know, no, these, these 45s and singles and these great songs just blow me away. I can't even tell you how much they mean to me, but I'm getting kind of emotional talking about them, but I mean, it's just the way it is, you know? Yeah. I've been, they've been with me all these years and they just stay with me, you know, and uh, uh, I think about them a lot, yeah. yeah. And well, when I hear them, I, I get chills, I just, you know, yeah. 
hearing them. You know, it's so amazing. You know, it's even like uh, I, I can't anyway. And I could start naming off all these songwriters that I love. There's so many. You know. Right. And bands like the Beatles and NRBQ, of course, were a big influence. I, I started opening shows for them in 1972. I remember in a band I was in, and they just blew me away. I said, that's the best live band I've ever heard in my life, period. I mean, that was just, uh, yeah. So it goes on and on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting to hear what influences like that you carry with you in solo shows, things like that. But you're also a longtime member of the Lonesome Brothers. Yeah. You go back and forth between playing with bands and Yeah, and Jim Armenti and I started that right. band 31 years ago. And right. uh, mm -hmm. I play bass in that band, which mm -hmm. I started playing bass in the 1960s. And been lucky enough to play on different people's albums and yeah. stuff over the years. Too. Well, you have a reputation locally and further for being a great team player like that. And just wow. uh, the fact that you just put out the Shy Requester, right? Your new solo album. It, it just so uh, happens is, uh, that, yeah. <laughs> see see well, what marketing 101 did I didn't for mean me? to do that, yeah, but right? yeah, yeah. here's, here's yeah, Grey yeah, Bass yeah. and Shameless Plug. Oh, you, you mentioned album. it, and I knew enough yeah. to grab that right away. Yeah. I'm curious about that because. My it's, 13th uh, album, anyway. In Lonesomes, we have eight, but no. 13 and eight with the Lonesomes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I guess that makes 21, but anyway, it's. I'm just curious. It's probably enough. Any thoughts you have about playing solo versus with the band? Do those two different things for you? I've been you playing solo for a long time. I mean, right. I, I remember I started playing solo like way back, I forget what year it was, but I used to play at the Rat in Boston solo and um, uh, all different places solo, really. That was the thing. Uh, Green Street Station, Joyce Linehan used to book that. and. Uh, you know, I used to play there. She would have me play solo with this very guitar, and I would be followed by the either orchestra, which were like about a 20-piece big band out there, Sun Rock and a jazz group. They would go on after me, you know. And so, it was called the either orchestra? Yeah, yeah I don't think they're together anymore. <laughs> but I used to do bills like that there, you know, with Yola Tango, Galaxy 500, and stuff like that and, and, uh, over the years. And I've had the band for a long time. Yeah, so does that... Does that feel different? Does that scratch a different kind of itch? Uh, for it's you much to louder. Play solo? The band is much louder. Yeah, yeah and it's yeah. rocking. Yeah. yeah. Those guys have been in my band for like 20 something years and uh, I love them all. They're just, you know, they kick me totally. I mean, you know, it's just like, uh, yeah, it's like a force. You know, it's like a Mack truck going down the thing. Yeah. So it's, it's softer when I play solo, but I love doing this too. So, and then I like doing the Lonesome Brothers. Why can't I do it all? <laughs> can I do all three of those things? If you yeah. play for 50 years, you can get there. <laughs> Some people might never believe that. You've been playing for 50 years. Yeah, it sounds like you just started. No, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I, I want to pick on myself. Not bad. Any uh, questions for Ray Mason? Kristen? I do. How has the um, audience changed? You've been playing for so long. Have you noticed uh, like the audience? Uh, for me, uh, probably less of them. No, I'm not, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going no. to let in a latecomer yeah. while you answer this. Thanks. And I'll be back. But, um... No, I, you know, one of my mottos has been over the years, I play the same whether there's five people or seven. So, you know, you get the same show, you know, it's like, you know, matter how many people are there. So, yeah, to me, you get in the car, you go play your gigs and you hope that people come show up and you promote the gig as much as you can. And you pray there'll be some people there to hear you. And, you, and if there's one person there to, to hear you, you play that show for them like it's the last time you're ever going to get to play. Cause, in my case, it could be, but then you never know. And anybody, but you know, you just do that. You gotta, you gotta love what you do and go out and do it, like it is going to be the last time you're ever going to get to play. And so I don't know if that even answers your question at all. But it's like, I think, the audiences haven't changed in that way. I know some people always say like, oh, I remember when people used to always go out and hear music. And they don't do that as much anymore. But I think the real music lovers do, and they seek things out and they go and they they listen to music. I mean, I can't imagine not doing that. I mean, but life wouldn't be the wouldn't be the same, you know. I don't know. Do you have a favorite place you like to play in the area? No, I like anywhere I'm playing. Like right now, I love being right here. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's wherever I am. I mean, you know, I played in like so many different places over the years, from here to California, whatever. And um, I think that uh, I've played in every type of situation you can think of, in a way. But the, I always just do my own thing. I just play my own tunes, no matter no matter what's going on around me. Yeah, yeah. Something I mean. I try not to let things bother me as far as that would go. You know, it goes back to saying like you know, someone's there to hear you play. You play for them. You don't let that ever get to you. I don't think you know, because 
I could drive you nutty, I think, yeah, if you want it, but I think you just play like that's, it's what you do and you love to do it and, and you go out and you do it. Other than that, I think of myself as a professional driver, really, yeah, because I think musicians, uh, when you're driving in a car with a musician, I, I think you're pretty safe. You don't need to clutch the dashboard, you know, and because uh, I always tell people, no, you're with a professional driver and in between my driving, I get out and play my songs and I get back in my car, so. Anybody, I know musicians out there, you know what I mean, so, yeah. Does anybody else have a question? I can go off right now. <laughs> Do you have one over here? I had a question. I just actually it was the same question you had. I've been around here for 50 years. You must have had like a favorite place to play. Western oh, maybe like going back a ways to. Your favorite, your I used to have some. Club of all time that, that um, <clears throat> there was a couple of them in Northampton, actually. Uh, the, I'm sure you know about. Um, Oh, not too far from here, actually. Uh, Rahar's and Sheehan's Cafe. Sheehan's is a clothing store down there on Pleasant Street across from downtown Sounds, but it was a great club. I used to play there a lot. I played in the original Sheehan's before the downstairs was there. It used to set up in the window, front window facing out. And then they opened the downstairs, which used to be just for storage. And uh, they turned that into the space. And I remember hearing Hubert Sumlin down there, I heard the Pixies on like a Tuesday night. I heard Flaming Lips in there as a trio, um, played tons of gigs there. Rahars played there uh, with a bunch of different bands that I was in. And uh, one band, our first gig there was a double bill with Mission of Burma. And Rahars, you could go and hear, like one night you could hear the slits from England. The next night, Albert Collins would come in. And the third night, Buddy Rich and his big band were there. And uh, back in the happy hour days, and me and my buddy, who was a dr drummer, sat at the bar, and Buddy Rich walked in. He walked by, shook hands with my friend, and immediately went to the pool room and just shot pool all the way until his, his show started. Yeah, just <laughs> was in there shooting pool with the sax player, you know. And, and uh, but uh, the stuff you could hear is just—I I just like those clubs. They were very uh, casual in their own way, but the people that came through there and played were. When I think about it now, it's just like. Amazing. Of course, you had the rusty nail, and and right down where the there's a package store there now next to Roberto's used to be a club called Paul's Cafe where Bold played. But after that, it became the Lazy River, and all these different bands played in there, and I used to play in there. That was a great place to play too. So, um, but see, I don't want to get back in. I'm not getting back into any kind of thing like oh, it was better back then because it wasn't, you know. And now you've got, you know, the parlor room. You've got the parlor room there, and you've got the Iron Horse. You have all great places to play in Northampton. To me, there's always places to go hear music and play. And I'm not into the, the thing of, like, oh, something was better back then. No, no, it might be different, but uh, it's always good. There's always, like, great original music going on around here that every type you can possibly think of and people creating it all the time. If you want to find it, then you can, you know, but... Uh, and hopefully it's knocking on your door sometime. Yeah. Thank you. That's probably it. I mean, I don't know. I was playing somewhere at a school not too long ago, and I think that uh, maybe my time was up, but uh, my, my friend who was a teacher there was out in Waltham, and, um, and he said, hey, you want Ray to play another one? And everybody in the place said, yeah, yeah. They were all applauding except for one kid. He, he got up and he started yelling, he's got to go. He's got to go. Look what time it is. He's got to go. And, and I didn't know what to say to that. Eventually, I just went, majority rules here, I guess. I don't know what to say. Yeah, OK. So. Anyway, back to that CD. I'm just going to do a few songs off there. They're all really short. And uh, 